Um, so I'd like to welcome you to the new researchers event. We're very happy um, that Methods at Manchester have allowed us to co-host this event with us today. We're also very happy to have uh, Wendy also here to give us um, our talk. She's very kind enough to fill in at very sh short notice. I just want to tell you a little bit about the, the New Researchers Network. So it's, it's part of the Policy at Manchester initiative, and its aim is to bring researchers, young and new researchers from across the university into a single group so that they can discuss and share ideas. So it's a really informal group. I would encourage anybody um, who's interested in joining, you don't necessarily have to do policy research, you don't necessarily have to be an expert in, in methods, it's just an informal uh, forum for discussion among, among new researchers. Um, so that's just my spiel, so it's my pleasure to int uh, introduce uh, Wendy. Uh, so, uh, yes, so we'll, we'll circulate these uh, later. So these are all just the contact details for the, uh, the new researchers network. Um, but I know we have a packed schedule, so I'll hand over to, to Wendy. <coughs> Thank you very much, Ian. So I'm Wendy Olson, and I was brought in in the middle of last week to give this presentation, so I thought I'll do my best. I don't know if it's what everyone will like. But I have printed two copies of the slides, because I know there's always somebody who really feels they need to see that and take it away. Uh, actually, I have three. So who would like that? Yes, one, and two, and third one. The, the slides will be circulated. They're, they're going to be available on the Methods at Manchester website. That's how we always do it. It becomes a hot link. And I also have um, to, to really thank everybody for coming and hope that you're going to enjoy the talk. I will be asking for some feedback in the middle of the talk. It's like a buzz question. So everybody should be trying to get hold of one piece of green paper. There are spares on that table and on the fourth table back. So make sure that you have one piece. And then you'll be ready to give me some feedback, not about the uh, quality of the talk, but on the content, actually, so that I, I get an indication of what your intentions were. And um, it'll help me, actually, in the future for planning. So I'm really happy to be talking about mixed methods. Um, I will focus on applications that are in the policy area. But because I've been working on mixed methods for a number of years, I, I suppose, in a way, I know too much. I know too many papers. And I also know the textbooks in this area. So I decided to cite them and chat about them and talk you through some of that literature to, to give an indication of what would be the most helpful things to read. So my audience, I know, is expert researchers and PhD and early career. Um, and my aims now are to go through some quite challenging material that I've been developing. Um, I have a book out, which I'll mention, which for undergraduates. And that supports the integration of quantitative and qualitative data collection. But here I'm going a bit further with advanced and systematic methods. And I will mention all the software packages we use. Um, so the aim here is to link qualitative and quantitative research methods. Right? And I, I'll speak a little bit about the other forms of mixed methods, which would be qual with qual and quantitative with quantitative, I suppose. So, you know, there's a lot of different alternatives there. But the one I'm really interested in is when we do have quantitative methods in the picture. So I, ho I hope that's what you were expecting in terms of the methods that I'll be covering. So for me, it's really important for the mixed methods research to be scientific. And I always think you should give a definition at the beginning. So I'll give a, a sort of introduction to what I think is going to be a very good and hence very scientific mixed methods approach. Taking advantage of sophisticated methods. Why not? Including transparent coding of the data. So especially the qualitative data, many people are not having time in their project to code the qualitative data. And this is considered very bad practice if it's not coded. It's considered casual, informal, biased, and too limited. And it's not transparent. <coughs> That's what bothers me, is that no, but no other scholar can check the work unless it's been coded. So I'll, that's what I think about the qualitative part. And we obviously also use sophisticated methods if, we have, if we're handling any numbers. It very soon gets sophisticated somehow, either with exponential, exponential growth in a spreadsheet, or it could be microdata, or it could be statistical methods maybe. But a lot of mixed methods it doesn't use statistical methods, but it still gets sophisticated. So we, when we do use statistics, we should be intensely cautious about the claims that we're making. And I've seen so many people taught that you generalize when you make a statistical test. But 
that's not necessarily the case, and it has to be done very carefully. So this generalization is sort of not, I don't think it's the purpose of mixed methods, but it's something that is often done with mixed methods. So that's, that gives you a sense of where I'm coming from. Uh, and textbooks that actually take this approach include Plano Clark and Cresswell, brilliant book dated 2008, The Mixed Methods Reader, and Cresswell's book uh, design, with Plano Clark, Designing and Conducting Mixed Methods Research. So I don't know if you've heard of those or not, but they're quite descriptive books about how to do it, how to collect the data. So they sort of duplicate what's in a lot of basic textbooks on data collection. I'm more interested to challenge what we would normally do, and I quite liked um, something written for economists by Sheila Dow on pluralism. So here the, the idea of Dow is much more sophisticated than in Cresswell and Clark, because Dow is saying we can have multiple theories. It's almost theoretical triangulation where you have this, well, if we had this theory, then we would have this data collection, and then this, and if we had this alternate theory, then what would we do with the same data? And then bring that to a conclusion about the theories. So, so that's, that's much more challenging, and here it's just a 10-page chapter. There is also a, a, cha a, a journal article by Sheila Dow. It's called Structured Pluralism. So it means the world is structured, and we take a pluralist look at the world, so Dow is useful if you're doing interdisciplinary research, and I bet there's at least half of you that are doing interdisciplinary research. So that, that helps a little bit in terms of books. Now this is the one I've written. Again, this is meant for anybody to read, any undergraduate or postgraduate. Data collection, key trends and methods. And so what I'm saying in the talk actually corresponds to some of the, the tricks and ideas of, of method that are in that book. I have written works on methodology as well. These are much, much harder to read, very abstract papers, and only to be recommended if you're, if you're concerned about somebody else's method not being valid, and you want to challenge their method by using a different method, or using their method better. You know, when you're getting into that sort of really methodological research, that's when to start looking at books like Practical Realist Ontology or Realist Methodology. This, this I can send you by email. I own the copyright on these, so I can send you, and it's a review of all different methods from a realist point of view. But what, what do we get from all this? Who cares about the book? These are the points. A, B, C, D are the points that I've been making that help you with mixed methods. And I can tell you from my personal experience that policymakers are more likely to listen if you do some of these things than if you don't. So if you have a very basic study, and uh, perhaps you have 10 case studies, <coughs> huge amount of data, and none of this, the policymakers will say, well, that's only 10 case studies. And there won't be that respect. So you need that credibility and respect. So let's look at what these are. Um, using statistic statistical techniques in a mixed method context usually means you're gonna get a wide audience for the results of the statistics. And you're not just publishing for other statisticians. You see, you're, you're the expert, or someone in your team is the expert, and then you publish it, and the policymakers are reading that. So they have to trust you, and you have to have credibility. And I think that goes really nicely in mixed methods. Um, systematizing and testing hypotheses is another advantage of mixed methods. And I would suggest to you, I'm putting this out deliberately to be controversial and challenge you, if you're traditionally a qualitative researcher in your background, do you test hypotheses with qualitative research? And many people say, no, of course I don't. Quali you, know, you were taught at undergraduate level, quantitative statisticians test hypotheses, and qualitative do exploratory. That was a basic lesson, which I think is very flawed. I think it's wrong in the undergraduate textbooks. So I would suggest, even on the qualitative side, you could systematize and test hypotheses, but just very carefully and not the same kind of hypotheses. So they're not about maybe generalization to the whole population. And I have had a lot of challenges in doing this. So can I tell you later about one protocol for doing that? Um, where, say, if we have a list of 200 cases, and we break them into types of cases, and then we say, well, I have a hypothesis that's only about these 40 cases because they're of a particular type. This hypothesis is appropriate there. That, to me, that seems totally worthwhile. And then I take on the other groups, the other 50 and the other 110. But to statisticians, that's not hypothesis testing because it's not a universal hypothesis. And um, it's, it's very controversial, but you, it can be done. So that's B. <laughs> and then you have epistemology. So you need some kind of rigor. 
and you need some kind of discovery as well. And it can all be done. And I think the rigor is in my previous slide. Rigor in, in the qualitative side is in the transparent aspect of what you're doing with your data. So I think using qualitative software is very important in mixed methods for policy because people can actually see what you've done. So an example of that would be a, a coding tree. And you'd argue the case for your coding tree, uh, which I can't show you today. You would have to have some training. And it, it, uh, I just hope that you'll trust me that epistemological rigor is a good idea. It means like having, not just having validity, but having the ability to argue on specific grounds that this finding is valid. And one of the classic ones is to say, well, it's valid because I went at it from three different angles and each angle led to the same conclusion. You know, so I went at it from a case study angle and then I did some interviews, but I also checked the international data and when I picked out this particular country, it also showed the same thing. And that's called corroboration. Corroboration is C, uh, perhaps, sometimes. And it, if it works out that way, that's really useful. <laughs> uh, but also you can add value with ontological richness and depth. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spell out how some of these things happen as I go along. Um, but like I say, there's a huge literature. And this particular article by Flick is extremely interesting. It's old. It's from 1992. But what Flick was taking up was the question of whether you should be doing corroboration. You know, are you supposed to just be reconfirming the hypothesis? Well, no. No, no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't really, in general, be doing corroboration or verification. You know, you should be giving people a chance to challenge the original starting point ideas and find out whether there's some other thing that's going on, you know? So say if you took an example like... Um, riots, and sometimes the riots would be called a spring rising or, or something like that, or perhaps Arab Spring. And then you say, well, actually, the, what's happening now in China or Hong Kong is not at all the same as Arab Spring. So we, we just need to find out what is happening. And so what, what Flick said at the very general level was that you don't just go out and try and validate. So we don't go and validate whether Hong Kong's situation is an Arab Spring, you know, whether it follows all that pattern. We, we go out and we find what's going on that's new, that's different, and we, we then make comparisons. So his alternative um, was that, or it's actually it's Uwe Flick, it's, it's a woman, <laughs> um, is that it's more like you use mixed methods to generate a new set of hypotheses as well. So you're both testing and doing something new. Now in the undergraduate level, <coughs> people are taught to separate those <coughs> activities. But in the postgraduate level and professional research, we carefully integrate them. So we go step by step. First, we check whether the usual model would fit. Next, we, so we're hypothesis testing. Next, we move on to, is there some new, let's find out what's happening and generate some new hypotheses. And then we can check again whether those are corroborated or if there's some difference, some differentiation, diversity. But mixed methods is very challenging. And usually, it's done in a team. But if you're in a PhD, then you're expected to do it all yourself. So I brought an example, and this is a policy-related example. Allow me to just glance through some slides on a, on a different topic. May I do that? It's a bit weird. But <coughs> I wanted you to see how it looks in a conference environment. When you go to the professional conference, and mine would have, um, let's say, this conference on economic and environmental insults of 2008-9. It means what happened in India was not a recession, and it was not a banking crisis. It was different. So we called it this thing. We thought it would be a test of the recession hypothesis, but it wasn't. <laughs> um, and the conference would have about one-third policy people. So you have to make it really easy for them to comprehend. This was published later as multiple shocks and slum household economies in India. Oh, I forgot about this. It's a smart screen, actually. So I can just tap. So I'm going to just tap through and show you a mixed methods presentation with policymakers in the audience. So first, hello. Maybe not. <laughs> the first slide is the aims of the paper, which are multiple. And then the second slide, background, obviously. Then starting to define the number of cases in the main study, 91 households, and the Gini coefficient for those. So that's numbers. That's your quant so you're starting your quantitative part. A Gini coefficient measures the inequality within the slum. And um, actually, the slum had quite high inequality, to our surprise. It's the slums in South India. And then we had income and wealth from a survey. 
and the survey had only 58 households. So whenever I did any statistics on that, nothing was um, statistically significant. But nevertheless, we give people the findings because they're so interesting. Nobody measures the income of slum dwellers. So the wage worker is 6,000 rupees a month and self-employed 8,000. It looks different, but it isn't statistically different because anything with only 58 cases is not going to give you a good p-value. This is a small-scale qualitative survey. So it's really mixed methods. And um, we, we then graphed some of these features on bar charts and explained the question wording for another innovative part of the survey. So that particular part could be shown in a bar chart. It happens that the horizontal axis here is ordinal. And then, um, again, you have a problem that it's a small number of cases, so you don't really get um, statistical significance. Nevertheless, the results are interesting in terms of their patterns. And we looked at whether that had a triangular pattern, which wasn't very strong. So what you see in this is a lot of words on the slides, a lot of carefully thought through you know, arguments with various kinds of diagrams to support them. And actually, policy appeared at the end because we had experts in our team. This is a big funded study, more than a PhD. And experts in the team were able to, to, to conclude from the findings things about state transfers to the poor and especially how it would affect old people. Um, and whether stabilizing the prices of goods would help old people. So there were, there were direct implications. You can't just have unrelated policy conclusions. They have to be related to what's been done. So I suppose that's probably familiar to you, that that's how a mixed method study would look. Um, but it's quite ambitious and not very easy to do. Excuse me while I go back to the main one. Just, can I just pause at that, que at that point and just ask if there's any questions or comments or any, is that surprising to you at all? Yes, sure. I'm going to have a mixed method yeah. in my PhD. Yeah. But the problem is the um, participants are really less than 30 person. So how can I use a questionnaire with the same, you know, participant, you know, for interviews and yeah. questionnaire just there Yes, to yes, that's it. She says for PhD with only 30 respondents mm -hmm. in mixed methods, how can you use a questionnaire when you only have 30. Mm -hmm. So you're right to think that you wouldn't use the questionnaire to get numeric averages mm -hmm. or do regression or statistical methods on it. But there are these methods with spreadsheets mm -hmm. which can actually organize the data for those 30 cases. Yeah. And you might find that they come into types and those types might match up with what's already known about the national population. Mm -hmm. But then, so, you, so your preparation is in a spreadsheet style of, of holding 30 and actually the questionnaire can be used to gather the data you see so there's no reason not to use a questionnaire as a structured method of getting the same data from everybody yeah but how can I justify this for my you know examiner because because, I because think you're not justifying your generalization your ultimate aim is not generalization no. to the national population no, or depth, you know, some people are doing firms you know departments organizations we're not generalizing we're finding out about these types. Yeah. yeah. So you have to follow a different protocol, not a statistical protocol. Mm. <laughs> so I, I will present those near the end. I'll give you three of those to choose from. Yeah. And, and I would encourage you to, to just don't do statistics on that. Just don't even pretend to. But numbers is not the same as statistics. Questionnaire is not the same as statistics. Mm. So what is particular to statistics? It's the inference from sample to population. Mm. Don't do that. When you have 30, you're not making inferences. But you can draw conclusions. Mm -hmm. This is what I teach in the summer school. Methods at Manchester has a summer school on mixed methods. Mm -hmm. And we teach how to draw a logical, well-defended, you know, well-argued conclusion from the data mm -hmm. about those cases. Yeah. And it's not a generalization. No, not so mm -hmm. generalization. Yeah. But you, you can do a lot, so don't worry. <laughs> Try not to worry. OK, so I've been going through some general points. Now I just wanted to find systematic mixed methods, which I'm recommending to you. I'm saying you should still have that systematized evidence um, because you can look for patterns that appear in the data. So with 30 cases, she can plot it on the chart and put all the 30 dots on the chart and look for a pattern. And if it's a triangular pattern of any kind, there are distinct ways of interpreting that. Or if they fall into two you know, distinct groups, then you can obviously interpret that. Yeah. So types and typology are really important. But even this sort of pattern that's more than a type, um, it may be a sign of durable social structures. That the, what are your cases in your particular case? Uh, 
academic librarian, their acceptance of technology as education and training tool. Oh, okay. So, so each are, librarian is one yeah. case, yes. and how they accept the technology is yeah. what you're studying. Yeah, so you need some basic information about the librarians, mm -hmm. and you might make a typology from that. But people don't even know how to make a typology using Excel. Mm -hmm. I know. I can tell you very briefly, but it's not taught typically. You take Excel and you put the small you know, questionnaire information in there, age, professional education, uh, departmental job title, all yeah. the features, yeah. a sex, you can have their sex, and then you do a nested sort. So you put data filter on the spreadsheet and start sorting column by column, and you end up with groups, and the groups in the rows have typical similar evidence about them. That's a type. The next type is another group of rows. And I, I didn't bring an example because we haven't got time today, but you need to get used to spreadsheets and how we can just organize that small data set and see the distinct types. You can't do cluster analysis because you haven't got enough cases to do the statistical method called cluster analysis. But you do it quite logically. So if they're of, a, of, the, of different sex, that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I omit that. The key features are how advanced they are in their education and in their career. Yeah. And now I see distinct types. And yeah. then you start working on types qualitatively. Yeah, so it, it all will fit together. So that would not be qualqual. So I've, I've just put on this slide the words qualqual and qualquant. I'm sorry, quant, quant. To let you see that what we're talking about is qualquant. That's what I really want yeah. to promote. And <clears throat> it's the hardest one. And, and can be systematic. So, you know, don't get distracted from not studying power. You can go ahead after you've made the typology and the types, then you stop that work, mm -hmm. and then you start with the interview material, you put it into, you know, you type it into a transcript, and you start analyzing that transcript, and you see relations of power, or you might see social representations, you know, discourses, all the things that we have in our qualitative repertoire. Um, but you've added to the repertoire because you've said, no, but I also have my systematic typology, mm -hmm. which is a, a grounding terminology for how I'm going to describe what I found out. Mm -hmm. Now, there's, a, there's a, a word, abstraction, right? Abstraction is different from generalization, isn't it? So we're yeah. not generalizing statistically, no. but we are going to abstract. So from these librarians, I'm sure we'll find some junior librarians, beginners, some urban leadership group of elite librarians, and some middle group. Yeah. It might be like that, and, and it's, it, that's real. And then we can inquire about what's happening with each of those three groups. Yeah. So you, you get things that are so solid. Um, the solidity of it with the foundation is not what we usually have in social constructionist qualitative research. So I, th I think it can work very well. Now, you can have qual qual with a systematic approach. You can do that. Uh, for example, focus groups plus interviews is qual qual. And it's quite cheap, quite small scale. It's useful. Or you can have quant quant, but I don't recommend it. Just using different statistical methods on a large database. If you never go out in the field, it's going to be difficult to really be original. That's the trouble. So we go out in the field with focus groups or workshops to, to try and be more original. I think, I think that's right. And it, you, you can use the word exploratory or original. I don't mind. Uh, so even in systematic methods. So here's the names of two methods. Qualitative comparative analysis is like what I've described. Mm -hmm. You put each case on a row of a spreadsheet. You do the casing to decide. So we decided on librarians, not libraries. Mm -hmm. yeah, somebody else in the future might work, work on the libraries. Uh, that allows the context to sit as very it's in the columns. So how big is your library? Yeah. yeah? Is your library in a city or in a rural area? Mm -hmm. Like that. Yes. Um, very interesting. And these are works. These, these are actual textbooks on how to do that. So I'm saying you can do QCA, Qualitative Comparative Analysis. I'll show you a little bit about it, but um, there are other methods. So another one is Envivo. How many have heard of Envivo? And how many have used it? We're not offering a lot of training on NVivo because it's a huge package and it's time consuming for us to train you, but you can just learn it on your own. You get the 30-day free trial and you pull down the um, instruction manual called uh, some in, you know, introductory guide. It's there as soon as you open it up in help and you just train yourself. It's fine. You don't need very advanced NVivo. So you use a simple software, NVivo. It's coding the qualitative data from the interviews, and it has a spreadsheet embedded in it. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah so the case matrix is this spreadsheet of the data, and you just can import that from Excel. 
and it's yeah. also helpful for literature review. Yes, it can be used for literature review, mm -hmm. but that's not the usage that I'm recommending. I'm suggesting that you put your data about your cases into NVivo. So there's all these combinations of software now. We could start with Excel, put this summary of the cases in Excel. You might have secondary data. And then make a summary and put it in NVivo. Or just make it simpler and put that in NVivo as a table. And then you link up the NVivo as cases, which are coded as cases, and all the other stuff is linked to the case in NVivo. For example, quotations from inside the focus group transcript. Oh, person four means case number 19. So we code that as case 19, and the computer recognizes this link. So I think that combination is very powerful. You can do the same thing from SPSS to NVivo, or Stata to NVivo, or you can use Ethnograph or Atlas TI. They're all the same. They're all as good as each other. These are nice if they're free. <laughs> and NVivo is free in the Faculty of Humanities. We have access to this. Uh, so ask me after if you need to know how. And then the output of NVivo we can put back into Excel or SPSS if we wish to. But that doesn't happen very often. So I want to take questions now on software. Yes? Oh, how do you spell the R? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like R. I, I like R, but I never succeed in using it. And I'm, I'm clever. You know what I mean? But I don't succeed in using it, so I feel frustrated with R. They have this R commander and some menu-driven parts. That's great uh, because it's easier to use. So what I like in R is it can run QCA or it can run um, fuzzy, which is a form of QCA, or Venn diagrams. There's a number of things R can do. I've made a little list just to, to indicate what you might find most useful. Uh, social networks as well would be measured in R, typically. Is that right? There's some social networks people here. Because they, ha they have also some alternative software. But it's quite good for making the graphs. But otherwise, no. I don't find that R is necessary. Okay, it's really for programmers to, to, to reprogram their computer. These are all meant for people who cannot do programming. And they have the drop-down menus. So um, these are more user-friendly. So if you want to do forecasts, I suggest Excel, prevalence <coughs> measures, SPSS, attitudes and social norms. You might need a better piece of software like Stata or M+. Um, and I'm, I'm currently working on combining that with NVivo. So, then, so any other questions on software? Just to, is there anything there that I, you didn't know about? Or? So there's, no, there's no magic software for mixed methods. It's you that has to mix things and find a way to work your way through it. So I always keep a um, project notebook. The way we do in the field work itself, I would also keep that for the whole project and be working through my project notebook, noticing themes and how they relate and keeping track of the surprises because whatever surprises you is going to surprise your audience. It's going to be the original finding in your work. Um, so I'm just going to move on, if I may. I haven't even defined stakeholder analysis. But you need to know some things. You need to know about sampling. So on the sampling side of mixed methods, I find this Levi Four is the best author. There are some other textbooks on sampling that now have mixed methods in them. But what I really like is the Levi Farr's advice for the uh, most similar, most different method of sampling. If you're only going to have 30 or 40 cases, you've got to be careful to, to make sure they have some things in common, some common groups there, like two, two um, say 15 librarians are in the west part of our country, mm -hmm. and the other 15 are in the east part, which is totally different. Mm -hmm. So we, it's almost like quota sampling. That's most similar, because we have now two coherent homo homogeneous groups. Next, most different is within these areas, we try and get the biggest diversity of librarians mm -hmm. that we can get. And what that means will emerge. So you could use snowball sampling. But the rationale is really interesting here, because you're trying to maximize the value added without losing any rigor in the study. Uh, but there are also these textbooks on sampling. So can I ask you, though, because I like to hear from you, are there any questions or suggestions on sampling that come from your projects? Anybody? OK, I'm going to be asking you to fill in my little green form in a minute. So you'll have to be thinking of a project. Um, can I run through some of the statistical methods that you could use even with the small numbers? Right, that would be useful. So we think that statistical methods for testing you know, two variables with a small number of cases can be used. 
what would this test be like? You can, you can either use your sample against some other survey data. So you get more data. You go and get secondary data on your topic. Okay, librarians as an occupation in the country. What are their wages? You know, mm -hmm. And you see if your sample differs from this national sample. Mm -hmm. That's a test that you could run. And so what I'm saying is there is a hypothesis test here. It's just a mini, tiny little part of your project, but it's very interesting. Many people can get the census, so compare your sample to the census. Mm -hmm. Find out which, you know, which kind of group yours is compared with that. Um, or you can compare your sample to a known distribution, like a uniform distribution. You can say, well, the school, the school should have people uniformly in each year. Same number in year one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's look at the distribution of my sample, and let's look at the school, and the school. So you can start to see how either your sample is wrong, or the school itself may have very few people in year six. And that's called a distribution, because it's the distribution of year for every case. So, so this is a kind of statistical work, but with small numbers. And we usually call that non-parametric statistical testing, non-parametric. Um, because we're not going to assume that there's a population out there. We're going to actually look at this little population compared with another, you know, specific population about which we have information. And there's, there's, a whole, there's whole books about that. Uh, these books kind of focus on ordinal and categorical data as well. So the slide, to be complete, the slide has to work you through what all these tests are. Now, I bet some of these are familiar. Median test. You remember median test? from earlier training, or Wilcox and Mann Whitney, or two sample Kolmogorov Smirnoff. I use this every year. In my research projects, I use this test because it's suitable for small samples. It's based on probabilities, and it's not based on normal distribution assumptions that require large samples. So I can have even eight cases, and I can compare these eight cases with these 22 cases, and believe it or not, that test will allow me to see, you know, whether the girls' age distribution is different from the boys' age distribution, which is extraordinary, really, because it's not what we usually think of as the big generalizations of statistics. But it is a probability conclusion. So in CMIST, we teach a course about this. It's called SSS, Statistics for Small Samples. And I think that's useful. Median, chi-squared, Fisher's exact test is the chi-squared version for small samples. So can you brush up on that and um, consider whether you should be using these particular tests? I, I can send you this sheet, or in fact, it'll be in the slides online. This shows which test to use under which condition. You know, but that's, that's complicated. That's a whole day's training, really. Are there any questions about these tests? Is anybody wanting to, to try and use one of these and has a question about it? Yeah. Like to try the one for small samples, the one you use. Okay, so say, let's say you were going to use chi-squared. Then, then for small samples, it's called Fisher's. It's a variation on chi-squared. So you'd have, you know, seven, six, ten, two. That's your little table of chi-squared. And the, the, the thing is, you word it in a different way. The wording would be, if this had been a random sample, then we could test whether this five, four, ten, two distribution varies and is different from a random distribution which may be 5555, five, 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 but it may also, it could be adjusted according to what the population is like. The sample yeah. is your population. Yeah. There's no other population. Mm -hmm. But we can do a test like that. Oh, yes, it's, it's a highly significant result. That means the 10 is a clumping in the chi-squared table, and we use Fisher's test, and it says there's a very low percentage chance of that happening. So it's highly significant. Yes. There's a clumping there. And it could be, you know, the majority ethnic group of your country has the most elite librarians. Mm -hmm. And all the ordinary low-level librarians, no matter how old they are, they're still in the low-level jobs and uh, in the minority ethnic group, non-dominant ethnic group. Mm -hmm. Some test like that is absolutely sophisticated, transparent, you know, scientific, rigorous. I mm -hmm. like it. And it fits within the whole study. So I hope, I hope that's a useful example. I certainly think... It's useful that you've offered that. Now, I have a list here of three protocols. I've mentioned QCA once, and I also want to mention process tracing and then factor analysis with workshops. Is anybody using process tracing? Oh, dear. Right, I thought someone would. Uh, Bennett, you've not heard of Bennett? No. And what about, is anybody going to try and use QCA or fuzzy sets? 
All right, well, it's time for me to find out what you are doing. All right, mm -hmm. we're, gonna, we're gonna have a little break here for an activity. So have you got your green sheet? <laughs> Get your green sheet and your pen. Yes, one each, one green sheet, please. And it's just a buzz question. So um, let me just remind you, in the study I described about slums in India, there was over a thousand people in a, in a census. That was a thousand. And then there was 187 households in the survey. Only 91 of them had a repeat survey two times later. So I got panel data on 91 households. And then there were interviews. And there was ethnographic observation. So it was kind of sequenced. There was a sequencing. And there was also this ethnographic part was going along all the way along. So that's what you could call integrated data gathering. Now, you got to think whether your project, you all have projects, right? Well, is it using sequenced data gathering or not? Or is it just all integrated, all in one? And is it using sequenced analysis or not? So here's your buzz question for your project rather than mine. What methods are you planning to use? Don't write that down, just think. And then write a Venn diagram, whether the data gathering would be sequential or integrated or both. So it could be both. That would mean, yeah, it's both. And whether the data transformation stage, that's you know putting it in and doing the chi-squared Fisher's test or whatever you're doing, coding, this would be coding, mm -hmm. whether that's sequential or integrated, and then the analysis. And I think you should all have an integrated analysis. I, I think that, it's hard. Um, but many people don't. Many people think, because the, the literature is about sequencing. The literature in those textbooks says, oh, will it be you know, focus groups first and then the questionnaire? Or will it be the questionnaire first and then the interviews? Mm. Those are the possible sequencings. Mm. But to me, that, oh, what's happened there? Mm. It, it doesn't really address. I'm sorry. I just hit something in there. It doesn't really address the key question. And, and you can also think, well, do you want to have impact? Are you going to have impact during your project? Because we're starting to have data collection methods like this green thing. This can be a data collection method while I'm doing my project. Mm -hmm. Just ask people what they think about it and get it back. So don't write your name on it. It's anonymous. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So there's no ethical issues there, and to give it back to me. And is your project transformative or integrative, corroborated? Can you just write me a note? about your project, and don't put your name on it. And what I'll do, I'll collect those notes in. So we've got about four minutes to, to do that. Right, what, what I noticed from the ones I've seen, a couple of patterns here, uh, many people do want to have integrated mixed methods. They don't just want to have sequencing of them. Um, and integrated seem to, to come across all the stages for a number of people. So that's interesting, because I don't think we really have textbooks yet on that. I think that's what I need to write now, because my integration would be at the level of the argument. The argument that we make here would integrate the data from here and bring it together to bear on a question, giving a clear answer with verbs in the answer. You know, so I, can't, I can't give a recipe for that, but I have those protocols which, which do guide us in particular directions. And they were also integrative here, so I think you liked the idea of Linking the software, did you, did you feel positive about that? Okay, so we're linking the data by having a representation of the data in two pieces of software and maybe passing information from the one to the other and maybe even a third for the diagrams at the end. So that, that was interesting. Thank you. Any comments on that activity? Comments or questions? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go back to the main slide. We've got about 10 minutes left. And we've really we've done a lot already. Sorry. And in, in a way, we have way too much to do because we have three protocols here, and each of those could be a half an hour session about how to do that activity. So I'm just going to give you a glimpse, all right, going through each of these three. They're, they're each very different and very very rich. So the first one is fuzzy set QCA analysis. That's the list of all the steps in the procedure. And I didn't bring the spreadsheet with me, but I've already deliberately described the kind of spreadsheet structure that we would have for the data. So basically, you get the data organized into cases, one per row. And that's, that's a hard step in itself with a lot of planning. And then you can have either fuzzy sets, or it could just be zero and one. They can just be whether the librarian ever had promotion or no promotion. 
Things like that that are qualitative appear in the spreadsheet as a zero or one, yes or no, did they or didn't they. You can have categories like ethnicity. There are four ethnic groups, so this first one, zero, one. This second one, zero, one. Third one, zero, one. Fourth one, zero, one. So as a series of binaries, the ethnic group's classification can appear in the spreadsheet. That's how QCA starts. And then, then it can look for those triangles of patterns between X and Y. And it uses the word combinations, which means also configurations. <coughs> so I don't know if you've heard of it, <coughs> but it is a really popular method. So I'll just check whether anybody feels, do you feel that you would organize your data that way in a spreadsheet? Is this for quantitative and or You can mix quantitative numbers there with the qualitative. Yeah. So you could have age and income and, you know, and it, the cases can be anything. Was there someone there who wanted to try that? Would you use a spreadsheet? Okay. You would use a spreadsheet? Okay. You said? Sorry. Uh, in, even for history, we can use this in history? Case. Definitely in history, yeah. Because in history, maybe your data is all spread out and you've got to bring it together. Yeah. And you write the summaries in words in en vivo as a code. And then the codings thing, you summarize in a table in en vivo. And then you export that table into your spreadsheet to add to the other information that you have about the cases. So it's quite amazing what you can do. So and Vivo kind of makes it like 3D, kind of like a table. It's not 3D, no, but you can have multiple tables. <coughs> if, if we had the cases clear, it would be a single table. But in Envivo, we also have all the texts and all the paragraphs and the focus group or the archival material, pictures, images, and our comments on them. So we start coding them. And eventually, we say, ah, I'm going to simplify this into a summary on a case-wise basis. And still, it can be qualitative. And then you can even summarize that again into 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So the table looks like some numbers and some one zeros, which is a summary of the other stuff. Uh, and it turns out Envivo can automate a little bit of that work. So I, I can't, I haven't got time to say much more about it, but it's, it's been attracting a lot of attention. There have been some rebuttals of the method saying it doesn't do generalization, it doesn't do as well as statistics. These have completely misunderstood the method. They have not allowed for this triangular shape. Um, so that's amazing. So if X is in the, if, if all the dots are in the lower right triangle, then X is necessary for Y. If all the dots are in the upper left triangle, then the x appears to be sufficient for y. And that's different from statistics. It's just not in statistics. And that's in QCA. So if you like the idea of causality and necessary causality, these are policy studies that have used that QCA. So this one's in development, Lamb and Ostrom. <coughs> it had policy as a thing defining the cases as a contextual part of the cases. What kind of policy did they have on water? And that becomes a column for the policy, and the cases differ on the policy. So that's one way that policy can come in to this. And Ostrom won a Nobel Prize in economics, so pretty good research there. Fist is more of a political economy one, saying from the table we can get ideal types. Am I going over time? Thank you. Uh, Snow and Cress is about homeless organizations. And there's actually a textbook that brings all this together. So I just have to finish my talk. But I've, I've really done a lot, than mostly what I had intended to do, because I've defined everything, and I can just conclude here. So the textbook on policy-based studies with QCA is by Ryu and Grimm. Ryu is the Belgian man. And he gathered together chapters on the application of QCA to policy. So you just look at that book and find out, or Google it. Uh, the, the second protocol, you remember, was the process tracing. And the key authors here are Bennett and George and Collier. And they just have five cases, four cases, looking in great detail at the cases. And it's purely qualitative. But the argumentation is sometimes a hypothesis testing argumentation. It's really interesting how how you would test. For example, a single case which refutes a theory is a refutation case. It's a falsifier. Like that, they work carefully through it. So they're not trying to generalize, but they take up these big cases, and history can be done like that. So in the case of the, you know, the war in Iraq in 1995, this is this. In the case of the war in Kuwait in 1993, this is this. And in the case of Hong Kong in 2014. So they, you know what the cases are macro? This is what comes yeah, will you, will you please look at the process tracing literature. And there's some references there on uh, policy-related policy related small and 
So I'm going to distribute the slides through m and and you can have a look. And you can see there's something that's helpful for you, because there has been an awful lot done. What I'm going to do next Monday, I'm having a workshop on factor analysis. So we're going to actually, um, maybe I don't have time to, to show it with the equipment, but we're going to get, a, get everybody in a room, get them to answer some attitude questions on which we've already done a factor using statistics. Mm. And then they'll scale themselves on that factor. And then we'll have a discussion based on the collection of notelets about what they think about it. Mm. And this will allow me to understand the diversity of opinion on the factor. So that's mm. on Monday. And it's not, um, it's not being advertised by Methods at Manchester. OK, it's a Facebook group. Sorry, we have to go. I'm so sorry. I conclude. How can we attend? Uh, Facebook, yeah. I've got a Facebook group there. So you can just look on Facebook for Integrated Mixed Methods, and you would, you work your way through to registration. Yeah. I'm sorry. I should have worn